Everyone, um, thank you for coming tonight. I'm Stacey Evers. I'm the co-chair of the Urban Ag Work Group that Diane was just talking about. And I just wanted to take a minute to also mention, um, I'm also the founder of Grow Row FC, which stands for Falls Church, Fairfax County and the city of Fairfax. And we are um, basically a volunteer led community organization that tries to connect um, backyard and community gardeners to food banks and food pantries. Now you all know it's not a lot coming up in the garden now, but in a few months you're going to have a lot, maybe even in a few weeks. And if you have surplus, we would really like you to join Grow Row and donate some of that to food banks and food pantries, or even just dedicate, um, if you're in a community garden, take a whole you know, part of it and dedicate it. We also um, are looking for people to be mentors, experienced gardeners who can be mentors, and we're also looking for couriers to help get that um, to the food banks. I'll put our information in the chat. And I just wanna thank you all for coming out tonight. This is gonna be a really great talk. If you haven't heard Bree, you're in for a, a big, big, big good time tonight. Um, Corey, do I pass it back to you or Adria? Adria, think, why don't you I go? think on to me. I so, think so. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, Adria Bordis, and I'm your Fairfax County Extension Agent. Um, we're um, happy to be one of the co-hosts this evening uh, for uh, Bree's talk tonight. Um, our Master Gardeners have been working hard doing virtual programs, um, and also are getting re gearing up to do some face-to-face -face plant clinics at the farmer's markets. Um, if you have any questions or you want to try to reach us, uh, contact us at um, our, our extension office in Fairfax. We're doing some teleworking, but to be honest, um, we have uh, someone in the office almost every day. So give us a call and let us know how we can help you. We're doing... Um, vegetable classes on when, on, excuse me, on Monday at lunchtime, um, all veggies, all lunchtime on Monday. And, um, and then we're also uh, always available to help um, at the, the plant clinics. This Saturday is our first community garden plot um, plant clinics, which are held at Grist Mill, Bow White Gardens, Nottaway Park, and Baron Cameron Park. I'm going to toss it back to Corey. Okay, welcome to Edible Plans for your front yard and landscaping. Um, as you've probably seen from the program description, we have a really special treat for you tonight as the uh, Fairfax Food Council, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and the Foundation, Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth have teamed up to hire uh, Bree, who um, has been a contributor on the in the award-winning uh, Growing a Greener World um, PBS um, television show, and she's wrote the book Gardening with Greens, and uh, my favorite, one of my favorite books, which is Foodscape Revolution, um, and I can't wait to get to hear all you have to say, Bree, so I don't want to steal your thunder. I want to turn it over to you, and uh, we're looking forward to having you here tonight. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all. This is such a treat. I was so excited when you guys got in touch about um, my coming and, and well, my coming, my, my joining you via, via virtual means and giving a presentation on this. And this is actually a, a, a special kind of new program. And um, just to warn everybody, it's 150 slides long and it's a whole lot of plant information. So I have sent it to the organizers, but I'm also more than happy to share this with you via email so that you don't have to take notes for every single slide. Um, I would be the greatest thing in my life if one of my PowerPoints went viral. So you can help me make that a life goal. And without further ado, I'm gonna hop right in because I may have been a bit ambitious about um, how much information we're gonna cover tonight. But for those of you who, who I haven't met, I do hope one day we will get to be together in person. My name is Bree, like the cheese. And I'm actually originally from Southeastern Michigan. I grew up um, in zone five. I studied landscape design and horticulture at Purdue. And I moved to North Carolina 19 years ago in two weeks. And I, I can't, I, I really can't wrap my head around the fact that nearly two decades have passed since I have been living in zone seven. But I have 
had the opportunity to, to have a lot of interesting um, different professions in the, the greater realm of horticulture, including most recently author and um, kind of communicator in this business. Prior to that, I actually specialized in propagating ornamental plants, specifically perennials and trees and shrubs. So a lot of my design ethic is very much based in ornamental horticulture. And I became a, um, oh, here, here we have an explanation. Uh, I spent more than 15 years in the back of a propagation house, um, kind of cultivating interesting plants to bring to the um, home gardener's market. But I really started growing vegetables. I had grown up growing vegetables. I was a 4-H'er when I was in Michigan. Thank you, hardworking extension agents, for all that you do to educate the public and especially for the time that you spend with children like like I was when I was a 4-H student. I would have never even known that horticulture was something that I could go to college for and have a career in if it weren't for my extension agents that introduced me to this awesome industry when I was about eight years old. But I started growing vegetables more out of necessity um, before the market crash when I bought a house in the subprime market. And I, first of all, should not have qualified for the mortgage. So there's step one. Uh, which, you know, I, I worry that we may be entering a, a market like that again, um, at least here in Raleigh, um, you know, houses houses are, are like not even listed for sale and they're already sold. And, and that's always a, a kind of a concern. But I moved into a house and I was working full time as a propagator and I just wasn't earning enough money to be able to pay my mortgage and my student loans and my car payment and all the other stuff that goes along with adulting to also have money to go to the grocery store at the end of the week. And so I started having to, you know, grow my own food really because I was just hungry. It wasn't that I was an idealist. It wasn't that I loved vegetable gardening. It was more because I, uh, I needed broccoli. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and it was cheaper for me to grow it than to buy it from the store. And it was a really interesting experience because I was living in a neighborhood with a homeowner association and they had a rule that said no vegetables in the front yard. And, you know, here I'm in a position where I don't have enough money to go to the grocery store. I really don't have money to pay an HOA fine you know, which was like several hundred dollars and it kept increasing every time we broke the rules. And so I worked really diligently to try and figure out, you know, how I could do this in a way that didn't offend my neighbors, that the HOA wouldn't, you know, get on my tail about it. And ultimately ended up getting involved with my homeowner association because I realized that, you know, this was a group of people who were volunteers, volunteer homeowners, who mostly were transplants from other parts of the world and also didn't have any experience in horticulture. So it seemed a little strange to me that they were, you know, making rules up even though they didn't have any actual expertise in this particular subject. And then I realized when I was sort of freelance designing on the side that there were a lot of other people in my own neighborhood and in all of the suburbs around me that were facing the same challenge, not really understanding what their architectural review board was looking for, wanted to take better advantage of their landscape by growing something that they could eat, but also not wanting to, you know, be chastised by neighbors. And that really began me on a journey that made me think a little bit more critically about how we go about growing vegetables as home gardeners. Because we're very much rooted in an agricultural ethic when we grow food crops. But there's an important differentiation when you live in a suburban neighborhood. You're not a farmer. You're not using a tractor. You don't actually have to grow in straight lines as if you are working on a farm. It's imperative that in a neighborhood with an HOA, you 
actually understand their guidelines and you know maintain the aesthetic in which you signed up for when you bought that house in that neighborhood whether you understood it or not and getting to the bottom of that was actually a very revealing and very empowering experience for me because i realized the rule shouldn't be no vegetables in the front yard it should be you have to be more thoughtful about how you plant your vegetables in your front yard. And that is a big distinction. It's not a war on broccoli. It's more a war on, you know, disrupting the infrastructure and, you know, removing all of your turf because in the long haul, even though I think we could do with less grass, grass actually serves a really important function It's a permeable surface that normal people understand how to maintain and so when you remove all of that all of a sudden your yard does look like an eyesore and so it's been a really incredible time since 2006 for me to be able to kind of see both sides and understand how I as a landscape designer and a horticulture professional can help guide people to just make better decisions about the aesthetic in which they go about when they want to include vegetables into their landscapes. And that's what tonight is all about. So one of the things that I love about food production is that it's something that unifies every human being on the planet. You know, whether you want to grow your own food or not, you still eat food. And to me, we're in a moment where we have to focus on the things that we have in common because we have had way too much time where divisiveness has been used to pit us against one another. And it's not making us better. It's not making us a stronger society. We really need to focus on the things that, you know what, it doesn't matter what race you are or how much money you earn how much education you have, at the end of the day, we have some really core, really important things that make us all the same. And that's what the privilege of food brings. It's an even playing field. Every person on the face of this planet needs to eat food. And the fact that horticulture gets to offer us the opportunity to grow food is the greatest privilege of my career. The fact that I can talk about something that is so relevant, that touches every person, is so much more meaningful than when I was working in the ornamental industry, you know, specializing in camellias that are only hardy for people that live in zones 6B to zone 9. You know, the, the bottom line is food can be grown anywhere and it should be grown everywhere because it's the thing that unifies our communities. It's the thing that can make your community different when you start growing it and you support the people who have lesser means than yourself. And it's an extremely important ethic for all of us home gardeners to carry with us because we have knowledge that can improve our communities exponentially. So I dream that landscapes can serve a greater purpose. I have been in this industry for more than 20 years, and I am i would be lying if I said that I thought that we were where we should be. We have a long way to go. I think the bar is set extraordinarily low. I mean, seriously, is this, is this really serving any function at all? The answer is no. Okay, it's not. This requires a ton of labor, which frankly isn't even a reality for this year, let alone 10 years from now. Because if you have been involved in the landscape industry, you know that like you can't even hire a landscaper right now because they're so busy. They can't find labor to work for them because the demand is so high. So why in the world would we continue to create landscapes that require a human being coming in to shear pointless shrubs and spray Roundup on open mulch space? This is not helping our environment. This is not making the building look better. This is not making your property more valuable in any context. This is just a, a, a this is just like a, a massive waste of resources. 
I mean, look at look at these. Look at these landscapes. These are brand new landscapes that I have interacted in in the last 12 months. I mean, are we serious? Are we really going to put lower petalums in a bed that's 14 inches wide and then leave the other side of the sidewalk open so that weed seeds can germinate? Is that really what our long-term landscape plan is going to be? Like, do you have any idea how much work this takes to maintain? This is not economically feasible. And frankly, it's not feasible with the current labor that we have access to. So we have to change. We are in a moment where we can't think that this is okay because it's not going to be possible in the long run. And why are we sinking resources in the landscapes that don't serve any purpose? Other than them buying the plants in the initial install, there's nothing else that helps the American economy as a result of this landscape installation. So let's think about the opportunities that we have, that we could use landscapes to actually train the next generation to be better stewards of this planet, to understand that pollinators are extremely important. We won't have food without bugs. Let's not kill all the bugs, right? Let, let's not think that, that pesticide is the number one tool in our toolbox because we can't live without insects. Let's get this generation trained so that they don't make the same mistakes that we all have. You know, let's get it so that our landscapes can actually teach people of every generation where food comes from. Because here's the deal, food doesn't start at the grocery store. There's an entire story to all the things we eat that have nothing at all to do with the end of consumer retailer. But when you ask your average 40-year-old where apples come from, they say Kroger or Publix or Wegmans. That is not where apples come from, y'all. That's where apples are distributed. But how is it that people my age, how is it that my generation doesn't understand this because we didn't teach it to them? So now is our opportunity to get this information so that the next generation doesn't answer that question that way. That, that question should be that it starts with your local farm, that your local farm is the source for your food and that we respect for our farmers and we pay them living wages because we literally can't exist without them. You know, I dream that landscapes can serve both the purpose of being pretty, but also serving the purpose of providing us something that is essential. And you know, when, we started using the term essential last year during the pandemic. It really concerned me because, you know, mow, blow, and go landscapers were deemed essential, but school gardens weren't. I think there's an ethical dilemma in which we are misusing the term essential because teaching children how to grow food is more important than someone blowing lawn clippings off of your driveway. You know, how is it that we live in a society where we are missing the understanding of what the actual term essential means? So my idea of foodscaping, and not my idea, it's just the idea I talk about, is just getting landscape contractors especially to start recognizing that they could play an essential role in our actual food chain by incorporating food in their landscapes by making food production part of their landscape maintenance service. Something that's way more important than spring roundup, actually growing food for the people who pay you. You know, doing something that people can't live without. And I think that that is something that everybody needs to really think about when you start making decisions about how you want your landscape to function. You know, it's not that you have to grow everything that you eat, that's totally unrealistic. But you could pick a couple of things that you like to eat and focus on growing those in a really creative, beautiful way that none of your neighbors will be offended by. And that's what I'm going to teach you to do tonight. Now, everything that I'm going to talk to you about, I was inspired by Roz Creasy. So Rosalind Creasy has written 23 books on the subject of edible landscaping. 
She is a wizard of horticulture. If you're not familiar with Roz, please Google stalk her immediately. You need all of her books. They are beautiful and inspiring and just chock full of super relevant information. Her latest book is The Edible Herb Garden. And um, wow, I have herb envy. Um, now, granted, we are in the, you know, in the Mid-Atlantic and East Coast. Um, it's okay for us to sometimes get jealous of people like Roz who live in, um, you know, Northern California where it's never hot and it's never cold and it's never humid. Okay. So I'm going to give you permission to just feel a, a tinge of jealousy uh, with regard to seeing some of her photographs. But the foodscaping plant palette is really based on diversity, very specifically, you know, drawing from a lot of different plant families. And you being in the driver's seat of making the best decisions about the plants for the garden that you are tending. So I want you to include native plants. I want you to have plants that serve ecological purpose. I want you to have the ornamental plants that bring you joy. And I want you to grow some of the food that you like to eat. And there's no reason that you can't do all of that simultaneously in the same space. So it's really important for all of you dedicated vegetable gardeners out there to recognize that, you know, our traditional agricultural approach to growing vegetables inevitably creates monocultures. And it's not your fault. It's just that the food crops that we grow as home gardeners don't have a lot of biological diversity. You know, right now in the spring, most people have at least a few of these plants planted in their vegetable gardens. But the thing is, when you isolate these, you're creating a monoculture because these are all in the same plant family. These are all brassic ACE plants. So they all get the same diseases. They all get the same insect problems. So what I really want you to focus on, and when you go around looking at your landscape, you know, make a list of all the plants you have. And then if you don't know the plant families, ask Google and start tallying how many plant families you have represented in your landscape. And then when you go to the garden center to buy new plants, try to focus on buying plants that bring in a different plant family from what you already have represented. Plant families are where biological diversity is rooted. And what this ultimately leads to is plants that bloom at different times of the year. So then you get different beneficial insects that move in, help kind of, kind of eat the bad bugs, right? Because let's face it, not all bugs are pollinators. I don't even know of an influencer who's calling an aphid a pollinator at this stage, although I'm, I don't want to hold my breath because those influencers who don't really know anything about gardening give a lot of bad advice. So be aware of that if you are getting your information from Instagram and YouTube. Um, the plant families are super critical, particularly with regard to the interaction of native insects helping create a balanced ecosystem. Now, what and when should you plant? And that's what the majority of tonight is about. I did not include a container section because I went overboard on plant selection. Um, and I did not include my normal rant about soil. But I will say soil prep is extremely important in the process of just, you know, growing plants efficiently. Um, I actually read a really good article this morning from Savvy Gardens. And it was Jessica Walliser, who has a fabulous new book out that is all about science-based plant pairings, ornamentals and edibles together. And so I'm using her new book as a reference for tonight. If you're not familiar with Jessica Walliser, also Google her. She's written like five or six really awesome books. Um, but the article today was all about understanding fertilizer. and Really what I think the new era of gardening is focusing on is soil science. And it's all about feeding your soil and not just feeding the plant. And this is why organic fertility and 
really good compost are so critical for being able to garden in a way that doesn't rely on synthetic chemistries, makes it so that you actually have less work because your plants don't grow artificially large, which then, you know, that's where all of those aphids or white flies target is that tender new growth. What you end up with is a, a more sustainable garden from the perspective of the plant developing appropriately, but also sustainable in regard to how much time and effort you have to put into it. And that's a really important consideration because I want you all to have well-balanced, happy lives in our, our post-pandemic post existence. So I want you to garden as efficiently as possible so that you get as many harvests as you want without ever having to use the W word because work, work is for work, right? Work is not meant for what you do in your free time. Gardening should be something that brings you joy and happiness, not tears and too much sweat and too many sore muscles. Although at this stage of the pandemic, I need more exercise from my garden. So when I work really hard and I come, I come inside tired and my bones hurt, I feel like actually that's the best thing that could possibly happen in my life at this moment. <laughs> so I made some guides for understanding best times for seeding, transplanting, and then harvest expectations. And this is the warm season guide. So we're really just at the stage now where it's time for you to start seeding things. Your soil is still too cold for you to be planting these things directly in the ground. And frankly, I want to encourage you not to skip spring. You still have an opportunity to grow a lot of these cool season crops just for the next like six or so weeks. So, you know, I never understand, people always complain about summer, right? Like by the time 4th of July comes, everybody's whining about how hot it is. And I'm like, well, why did you want to skip the summer in, in April? Why didn't you actually enjoy spring when we had spring? And that means that you don't actually have to plant your tomatoes right now. You can plant broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and arugula and all of these other things that actually want the, the growing conditions that we have right now at this moment. So I've been doing a ton of webinars and I've been doing these spring veggie garden classes where most of the information is about the plants that are on this slide. And inevitably everybody's like, but, but when do I do my tomatoes and peppers? As if those are the only two vegetables that anyone should ever cultivate. So I'm on a personal mission to get people to stop skipping the seasons. Remember, summer does not actually officially arrive until June 20th. And really, you can easily plant your, your warm season things, the, the plants that were on the slide before this right here. These can go in any time, um, really between the middle of May and the middle of July. So don't stress yourself out about getting your, you know, summer vegetable garden planted too early because you have a long enough growing season to be able to wait a few more weeks and take advantage of everything on this list. Now, real quick, I just wanted to, to tell you about the Dirty Dozen. Um, this just came out two weeks ago. So this is the produce at grocery stores that has the highest level of pesticide residues. So anything that you can grow on this list for yourself, you're gonna be doing yourself a favor or at least buy these things organically. Now, not all produce needs to be purchased with that extra price tag of organic, but the things here on the Dirty Dozen list are really important. The pesticide residue is a carcinogen. It is absolutely linked to cancer. And um, I just think as a home gardener, you you can do do something better for yourself than than you know put yourself at risk. So the things that have barns next to them are the things that I grow entirely for myself that I don't buy from the grocery store at all. Now I don't get to eat these things year round. I have to eat them seasonally, but uh, I've committed to myself that I am not going to. Um, unnecessarily put myself in harm's way. And I can do that through the act of home gardening. Now the clean 15 to make you feel good 
um, about things that you can buy from the grocery store really without thinking twice. So these are all things that have less than 2% uh, pesticide residue on them. So, you know, by all means, these are, these are things that you should feel really confident in being able to buy from the store, both organically and conventionally, also supporting local farmers markets. But again, the thing with the barn are the things that I try to grow myself, at least for part of the year. Um, and I've had a great deal of success with that. All right, so now we're going to get into the plants. And I first wanted to start with some perennial edibles that I think are absolutely worthy of your front yards, but really anywhere that you have sun. Remember, all of the plants that I'm going to talk about tonight want to be in more sun than shade. And generally, I would say ideally six or more hours of direct sunlight. Uh, it's very difficult to grow fruiting crops in dense shade. So if you're in a lot of shade, I encourage you to join a community garden, which might give you a plot in an area that is full sun or certainly support your local farmer's market. Um, in, in dense shade areas, you have more opportunities to grow in the late fall through the winter into early spring, particularly if you have deciduous trees. All right, so we can't not talk about asparagus. Um, you know, every, I'm not sure that everyone loves asparagus, but everyone recognizes this as a really reliable perennial crop. And, you know, you have a couple of options for planting it. You can buy it from in bare root form, which is just going to be a more mature plant, or you can start it from seed. I would say expect from seed for it to be closer to five years before you harvest. The general rule with bare root is give it three years before you start cutting it back hard. Um, the great thing is once you have it well established, you're gonna be able to produce a lot. Um, I actually cut my asparagus back in the middle of summer, usually the first week of August. And then I actually get a second harvest, you know, in August when it starts flushing out again. So I'm harvesting in April and August for my asparagus. So I call it the 3A rule. Asparagus is in April and August, once it's well established. Now, another great A plant. Um, I am a little obsessive compulsive, so I have everything in alphabetical order. Just, just, just so you understand my, my rationale, I'm not playing favorites. Um, the pawpaw, asinina, uh, this is a wonderful plant. You're never going to buy this at the grocery store. It, these fruits have zero ability to be shipped. They're very soft and tender. They bruise very easily. You might get lucky and find them at a farmer's market, but more than likely your best bet is going to be to grow this yourself. Now, again, this is a native plant, um, so really important for the ecosystem. In fact, it's the main food source for the zebra swallowtail caterpillars. So if that's not reason enough to grow it, the fact that you can harvest these awesome egg-shaped fruits, which are very tropical in their flavor. So they're kind of a weird hybrid between a banana and um, a, a, a pineapple. Um, it's a really unique flavor. I actually like using these to make pawpaw coladas meaning I put them in a blender with rum and ice <laughs> instead of using pineapples, and they're delicious. Now, you're going to be in direct competition with possums and raccoons for this fruit. Just accept that reality. Both possums and raccoons are also really important parts of our ecosystem, just like, um, you know, the swallowtail butterflies or the monarchs. Um, many of our other beneficial insects like bees and wasps. So, you know, don't discount the role that those mammals play. Um, maybe just grow a, a, a few different varieties of pawpaw so that you have enough to share. When you do harvest these, my recommendation is to just stick the fruit straight in the freezer. And that's going to help preserve it. 
obviously for a much longer time. Um, and it's also easier to work with once it's frozen because the, the texture of these raw is very soft, like a, a super ripe banana. And so when you have it frozen, it's much easier to be able to peel the skin off. And inside of this is a gigantic seed. So there is some, you know, preparation to the fruit when you go to eat it. Another great native edible that I think everyone should be growing is the persimmon. And this is also probably in a plant family that you don't have a lot of plants from, the Evanaceae family. Uh, this is often found natively in, you know, East Coast woodlands. And I'm very fortunate that I have quite a few Diospirus virginiana growing in my half acre native woodland swamp. And so when I started growing cultivated varieties of persimmon in my home garden, I didn't actually need to have a male and a female because I can take advantage of all of the native ones that are growing in my woods that are too tall for me to be able to get the fruit off of. And so this is what has led me to starting to grow a hybrid species. So it's half native, half non-native. And the advantage of these is that they fruit younger. They fruit on low branches. They have larger fruits and they don't have as strong a tannins. So you can eat them earlier in the season. So I mentioned I went to Purdue. Persimmons are a huge part of Hoosier culture. If anyone here is from Indiana, you'll, you'll probably recognize that. Um, but one of the tricks that native Indianans play is getting the out-of-staters to eat an unripe persimmon fruit, which will take all of the saliva out of your mouth for like six hours. And it's actually a really terrible experience. And so it's a quick way to make you not like persimmons, which is why I have grav gravitated towards this variety, Nikita's Gift, which is always ready to be harvested at Halloween. And frankly, it looks like a Halloween tree because don't those look like miniature pumpkins dangling from the branches? Now, figs, I actually have a love-hate relationship with figs. They take up a lot of room. They grow really well, but I absolutely never get fruit, and it makes me irrationally angry. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. I've been asking everyone for help. I have hardy varieties, so don't I don't understand what it is. Someone last weekend told me to put down Epsom salt. And even though like there's very little scientific evidence that shows that Epsom salt is actually a benefit, um, I'm kind of at the stage of desperation where I don't care. Whatever your wife's tail is, I'm going to try it. Because 10 years in the ground, I have yet to get a fruit from my, my fig trees. But the varieties that I recommend, uh, brown turkey, LSU purple, Chicago hardy, um, especially for the Virginia area, I think Chicago hardy is probably a better cultivar than LSU purple. And um, like I said, if any of you have any tricks for me, can you please email me? I will try anything at this stage. I'm, I'm quite desperate to have fruit that look like this on my branches instead of those tiny little green things that never ripen and then we get frost and, and it's all been a waste. Now I ate my first ripe strawberry right before this webinar started. So I have to say like April 14th is, is now a day of note in my mind. Um, I think even though we, we, were, we weren't exceptionally warm this summer, We've just had kind of a nice, very steady climate this year, which is not normal. Um, don't take it for granted. Appreciate the steady weather that we've been experiencing because Lord knows it may not stick around. Um, but yeah, I had my first strawberry from my yard just like literally just before I came in to sit in my office. And um, I grow strawberries everywhere. I'm a strong believer in ground covers. I don't like weeding. So my best bet is to cover the ground up with plants on purpose. So then the weeds don't have the ability to like take hold. And strawberries are a very efficient plant to grow. 
Um, some of my favorite varieties are Albion and Chandler. And the variety that I ate tonight was Chandler. It's usually my first. It's also my last. Um, it's been an evergreen perennial for me here in zone seven. Now I say they're deer resistant, but they're not rabbit resistant, y'all. Not rabbit resistant at all. In fact, those jerk rabbits have been out there nibbling on my plants and I, you know, I'm not okay with it. So I've been having to spray my plants with different rabbit repellents um, just to make sure that I preserve my harvest. So I actually grow strawberries um, as a ground cover, like underneath blueberry hedges. Um, I, 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 really, I grow them in a lot of different beds. So I probably have about 400 square feet of ground cover devoted just to strawberries in different parts of my yard. And on average, I end up freezing about 50 gallons of strawberries annually. So you don't have to have an actual strawberry farm to still be able to grow a lot of strawberries to make it so that you don't have to buy them from the grocery store. Um, I included apple because you are in Virginia and I think you can grow apples better than I can. I, this is a picture of me um, outside of Charlottesville at a cidery, which I always have a lot of fun visiting, though it's quite dangerous. Uh, because they usually start giving samples at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And it, you know, it, it leads to bad decision making. <laughs> um, but I've been very fortunate to speak at the Heritage Harvest Festival uh, for many years at Monticello. And they will often have a stay at, at um, Apple Work Cidery, which is just south of um, of Charlottesville. So a wonderful weekend excursion. Highly recommend it. It's not terribly far away from all of you. And they grow apples so well. I've learned more about apples from visiting the cidery than in my 42 years of, of gardening. Well, I guess I haven't really been gardening for 42 years, but my 42 years of life and my 19 years here trying to grow an apple that would be something we're taking a photograph of. I have yet to actually have a successful experience. I still grow apples. I still use them. They're just like full of scab. The plants are full of fire blight. Uh, they're not. They're they're not like Instagram worthy. But I think in Virginia, you guys have better resources than me, and certainly Virginia Tech has a ton of great information about cultivating stone fruits in your climate. Um, Rubus, I, I really have, um, in re recent years, I have indulged in Rubus. I guess I had an early experience when I was an estate gardener where blackberries and raspberries kind of became really invasive and I hated them for a little while. But then about four years ago, I guess the experience was far enough in the past that I decided to give it another try. And to overcome their potential invasive habits, I grow mine in large galvanized steel water troughs. I buy those from Tractor Supply. That way they're contained, but they fill the feed tank to the brim I get massive amounts of harvest each year, but I don't have to worry about them suckering and kind of taking over all of the rest of my garden area. So if you have a lot of space, by all means, put these in the ground, grow them out in rows. But like for me, I, I live in a suburban neighborhood. I don't have the room to let blackberries take over my entire property. Now, the variety that I am growing is Natchez. And it's just a, a very reliable, disease resistant, um, not exactly native, but definitely naturalized type of blackberry for the East Coast. And the raspberry that I've started growing is Heritage. And um, this, I am, have actually just been overwhelmed by the success in which I've had, because I've always heard that raspberries didn't like heat and humidity. And Heritage has been 
really reliable, totally um, mildew resistant, and um, provides a significant amount of fruit to harvest, usually through July and August. So uh, I, am, I am smitten with these plants. I'm hoping that I'm not jinxing myself by telling you about them. But so far, I recommend both Natchez and Heritage um, as a good home gardener's plant for growing your own raspberries and blackberries. Now you can't live without blueberries. So there you have it. Um, blueberries are just like, to me, they're the gateway to garden or to foodscaping because you buy them in a three gallon pot, no different than an azalea. And so landscapers understand what to do with them. You know, I mean, half the challenge of getting landscapers to do this is getting them to a nursery that actually sells edible plants. You know, they go to ornamental nurseries that don't grow food crops. And so landscapers just straight up don't even know where to shop to be able to buy a lot of these things. And so blueberries are always my first thing to include in basically any design. Now it's really important to recognize blueberries are self incompatible. So, okay, think about yourself, right? You can't impregnate yourself. You have to have somebody else. It's the same thing with blueberries and the reason that biologically this happens is to decrease inbreeding issues, okay? So this is all very logical. Like we don't need people to breed with themselves. We're gonna have a, a super weird alien race that, that would form as a result. And blueberries would be the same situation. So you have to have different cultivars. So you at least have to have two, Different, different named varieties. Remember, blueberries are asexually propagated. They're not grown from seed. They're grown from tip cuttings. So if you have two climax, they're not going to cross pollinate one another because they're the same plant. So you have to have a climax and a legacy or a powder blue and a legacy or any number of combinations. There's about 5 million blueberry varieties in the marketplace now. The critical thing when making decisions about blueberry varieties is cold chill hours. So I did the work for you when I gave you these three varieties that you should be growing in your climate. But if you wanna learn more about cold chill hours, just Google it. There's actually a website that you can put your zip code into and it'll tell you what your average chill hours are so that you make better decisions about the cultivars for any fruiting crop that relies on cold chill. Now, for blueberries, cold chill hours actually represents how many hours below 42 degrees. Not 32, because that would be way too logical. 42 degrees. So that means in your area, you typically are going to average somewhere between 800 and 1200 chill hours each winter. You're very much like Raleigh. We actually have a whole lot in common, um, especially any of you who live like closer to the city where you're practically zone eight at that stage, which is even warmer than me. So cold chill hours, really important for cultivar selection. Now I like blueberries because I think they're beautiful. I grow them to kind of create little rooms. Uh, there's one of my cats, Cubby, who um, does nothing but lay on comfortable furniture inside and outside, but he appreciates the fall color of the blueberries. And then grapes, uh, another really amazing native plant that we get to claim that the whole rest of the world gets to utilize. Um, in this area, you are mostly, your native grape is going to be Vitis rotundifolia, that's the muscadine, uh, which is extremely sweet. It's not my favorite grape. Um, it has a very thick skin. It's usually uh, has quite a few seeds. But all of the grapes that are grown globally for wine and for grape juice and for jam are all actually North American native fruits. Um, I am not a good keeper of vines, so I allow other people to grow grapes, and then I buy grapes from other people. Um, I have not devoted the time and effort to creating a proper structure to really maintain grapes. 
Um, so I'm not going to give you any specific advice on how to maintain these long term. There are other people who know a lot more than I do. Now let's get into some of my favorite flowering perennial edible combinations. So I've got a mix of native native perennials and their, their great edible counterparts. And we're gonna get started with Agastache. And actually there's a bunch of different ways to say that word. So my approach to botanical Latin is if you say it with confidence, everyone will think that, it, that you're saying it correctly. Um, so you can totally steal that little bit of advice and just, just pronounce every syllable. That's the main thing with botanical Latin. So I love Agastache and um, I grow it with a lot of different uh, food crops, especially things in the winter season when the Agastache is not actively growing. So things like broccoli. So one of the varieties of broccoli that I would recommend, you can buy this right now from garden centers, even box stores are selling this, is Lieutenant. And the reason I recommend this is because it's a, a, a really short crop. It typically will go to head within 45 days. So you can plant this now and you'll still be able to harvest before it gets too warm. Now, a variety that I'm going to recommend that you grow in the fall so that you can enjoy it all winter long is early purple sprouting. Sprouting broccolis are different from heading broccolis in that they put out a lot of small sprouts and then they will continue to be able to be harvested for a long duration of time. Um, the holy grail of broccoli, which really to me seems more like a cauliflower, is the Romanesco Italia. And um, I'll confess to you that I have never gotten one to like the big size that you see online or that you might buy from the farmer's market. My Romanescos always end up about like this. And I end up eating them like without even bringing them inside the house but I still try to grow it. I, I have 50 planted currently throughout my, my uh, food skateboarders. So maybe this will be the year. See, hope springs eternal when you grow plants. <laughs> now a cauliflower that I recommend, amazing. This again is gonna be one for you to put on your fall list because we're kind of running out of time for you to get started on brock or on cauliflower now, but amazing is great. This is available from Baker Creek from seed. And uh, purple of Sicily is also a really great cauliflower. I've grown this for many years and it, I actually do get like, you know, cauliflower heads that are like the size of my head, which is always my goal with cauliflower. Um, a great plant that will actually help ward off animals are alliums in general, uh, and very specifically this ornamental allium called Millennium. This usually blooms in the middle of summer, like June, July, and it's dormant through the winter. So I pair it with cool season veggies to overcompensate for it while it's not actively growing. So I grow Swiss chard kind of actually over top of the allium through the winter season. Some of my favorite varieties include bright lights and canary yellow. I've basically never met a Swiss chard I didn't like. Um, peppermint is another really beautiful plant. And you know, all parts of Swiss chard are edible. You eat the leaves, you can eat the petioles. If you yank it out of the ground, you can actually also eat the roots. So Swiss chard is just a super I think, versatile, ideal foodscape plant because it's so doggone pretty. No one in your neighborhood is ever going to complain that you have Swiss chard planted. It looks like stained glass. Now some kales that I grow along with that allium include this new variety called prism. And the reason I like this is that it's actually been bred to be more heat tolerant. So it doesn't bolt or set its flower and then turn very bitter nearly as early as some of the old varieties of kale would. So this is a great season extender. I usually plant this in September and I continue to eat it until the end of June. So it's a really long season to be able to grow an edible plant, continuously harvesting off of it. 
Another great kale to grow is dinosaur kale or lassianato. And this just has such an incredible you know, color, that silver blue color and this broadleaf texture. It's also really cold tolerant. So, you know, unless temperatures really drop, um, like kind of dramatically from being very warm to very cold. This is one of those kales that will make it typically through any winter season. A really important native perennial, Asclepias tuberosa. This is often called butterfly weed. It's a milkweed. It's one of the main food sources for um, monarch caterpillars to eat its foliage. Obviously, swallowtails also enjoy gathering nectar from it. And I grow it with a whole bunch of summer active plants, including corn, basil, and peppers. So some of my favorite corn for fresh eating uh, is here on this list. Uh, Breeder's Choice is a really great variety. Um, all of these you really can't go wrong with. Photographed here is Jubilee. But, you know, like we all have eaten Silver Queen at, at some point in our lives because that's often what farm stands will be selling uh, when they have fresh eating corn, like, you know, like a, at the end of the street or at the farmer's market. Now, some other varieties that are worth growing, not only because they're beautiful and corn is our only native grain, but these are great because you can dry them and grind them into grits. Uh, 19 years in North Carolina, I've become a, a Southern food eater. So, you know, grits, collards, okra, all those things are like top on my list. And um, glass gem is just a really beautiful variety. And of course, Bloody Butcher is the Virginia heirloom that was the traditional choice for grits 100 years ago. So everybody should try growing Bloody Butcher. Um, I also grow Asclepias with peppers. And the pepper of choice is this new variety called Mad Hatter. The advantage of this plant is that you get the flavor of a bell pepper and the productivity of a habanero. So on a single plant, you could have several hundred fruit. I'm not exaggerating. I grew this for the first time three years ago, and on one plant, we harvested over 350 fruit the day before frost. One plant. So you don't have to have a pepper patch anymore. You can just grow like a Mad Hatter and get all the peppers you'll ever need. Another variety of Asclepius that I think is really important to include is Hello Yellow. And this is especially if you have, you know, a landscape where orange doesn't work. Um, yellow is usually a color that, that um, you know, blends well into the, into the uh, landscape. And again, I grow this with a lot of different summer plants. So things like eggplant, okra, and rice. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you more about rice. But the okra varieties that I recommend, um, Candle Fire is the new and improved heirloom burgundy. So Candle Fire is just really practical because it doesn't elongate as quickly. So it gives you a longer duration of time to be able to harvest. So, you know, the thing with okra is like you blink and you miss your window. And then it's like stringy and doesn't taste good. Well, so breeders recognize that issue. And with candle fire, they just actually slowed down the ripening process of the fruit. Two other varieties that I love, Star of David, for those of you who are really into fried okra, Star of David is the one that you wanna use for that purpose. And then emerald okra is my favorite because it's, totally spineless. It's like the smoothest okra fruit you'll ever experience. I love okra so much that I frequently eat it raw right off the plant, but you don't want to do that with a spiny variety because it'll hurt your tongue. Like those spines like leave hairs and, and it's like getting paper cuts, but on your tongue, which is way worse than your fingers. So that's why I love emerald okra so much. Another great flowering perennial is Baptisia, and I highly recommend these new varieties uh, coming from Walter's Gardens. 
and it's the Decadence series. And the reason that I recommend these, they have been bred to be sterile. So the plants continuously put up flowers because they're never putting their energy into setting seed. And so that's going to extend your bloom season of Baptisias by a significant margin. So again, I plant Baptisias with full sun, summer active plants, things like eggplant, peanuts, and peppers. And some of the eggplant varieties that I recommend, um, the reason I like these is because the fruit are small. So they never get so big that they become like rubber. So the year that I was photographing the Foodscape Revolution book, I grew like 85 eggplants. No one in their right mind should plant that many eggplants because they're really capable fruiters. Like a normal person you could have four and you probably keep everyone you know in stock with eggplants as, as, as well as you eating them on a regular basis. 85 was out of this world. Like the food bank told me to stop bringing them eggplants. So I started growing these varieties because they're smaller overall plants, the fruit are smaller, they're easier to cook with, they're just kind of easier to manage that harvest. So Hansel, Gretel, and Calliope, three varieties that I've had a lot of success with. They're delicious, they're easy to grow, they're low maintenance. By the way, all eggplants will get flea beetles. Just accept that reality. Doesn't really matter, the flea beetles just eat the foliage, you'll still get fruit, you'll still maybe get more fruit than you even want, but I don't have the solution for flea beetles, y'all. I mean, the cover of the book has flea beetle damage on it, okay? So there you have it. I'm an organic gardener. I'm not spraying pesticides. If I was spraying pesticides, I might as well just buy this stuff from the grocery store, right? All right, another fabulous native perennial, Echinacea purpurea, the coneflower. Now, I do recommend that you grow the actual coneflowers, not the ones that look like pom-poms. Those pom-pom ones don't produce any nectar or they don't have any available nectar for pollinators. So it's not really helping the ecosystem as a whole. So get these more single varieties. Um, I just love the straight species, but I've had a lot of success with the Kismet series. These are a little bit shorter. They bloom for a longer period of time and they are better for disease resistance, especially for us in the mid-Atlantic where we get a lot of leaf spot on cone flowers because we don't have enough wind blowing. Remember, these are actual prairie natives. We don't really live in a prairie climate. Uh, so there are some improvements to these modern genetics as far as their ability to have clean foliage. Now, I grow echinacea along with herbs, and the reason I do that is that Deer and rabbits love coneflowers. Like they irrationally love eating these, but deer and rabbits don't like culinary herbs. So you pair your echinacea with something like basil. You can plant globe basil along the edge, you know, or Greek basil. And the smell of that basil will prevent the deer from going in and then eating all of your coneflowers. So I've done this now for, for probably five or six years, and it is the only way that I get my coneflowers to, to actually produce flowers. Anywhere that I grow echinacea without basil, the animals eat all of the echinacea. Now, I have a few favorite basil plants, um, specifically varieties that are downy mildew resistant. So downy mildew is an enormous problem. I actually lost all of my rosemary to downy mildew this year. So it's something to be aware of. If you have it, you should report it to extension. Uh, it's something that's really important for the industry to be aware of so that they're not distributing plants that are pre-infected because the potential for downy mildew to spread is, is actually pretty significant. Uh, so two downy mildew varieties that are downy mildew resistant varieties are amazel, which you can find through Proven Winners, 
and then Everleaf Emerald Towers. That's the one that I'm hugging. And I really love the Everleaf Emerald Towers because in addition to being disease resistant, it also doesn't flower. So I grew this last year and it didn't start putting flowers out until October. So I didn't have to constantly cut the flowers off of my basil plant. And it's a delicious variety for both pesto and for like making caprese salad. And it's just an all together fantastic plant. So here is the amazel. And then here is that glow basil edge, which I always plant these kind of, I plant basil around all of my bed edges in the summer season. And I space them like eight to 12 inches apart. You can find glow basil at Home Depot, y'all. It's super available. Like you don't even have to grow this from seed. You can just buy plants. And it's not the kind of basil that you really want to cook with. In my opinion, it tastes like burning hair. That's why it's so good for deterring animals, things like rabbits and deer and groundhogs. Oregano is another fantastic culinary herb to include because animals don't like eating it. And of course, you can't beat the color of the Aria variety. Um, and here, this was actually a picture I took at the Atlanta Botanic Garden where they have deer inside their gate. And they were like, the only way we get daylilies to bloom is if we plant oregano around the daylilies. So there you have it. Uh, rosemary, another plant the animals don't like to browse on. Um, this is probably maybe marginally hardy. We get an awful lot of rain in the mid-Atlantic for growing Mediterranean native plants, okay? So just be aware of that. It's not your fault. It's where we live. We have nothing in common with Greece, okay? At least from a climate perspective. So expect that these may not be long-lived perennials. Doesn't mean you shouldn't grow it. There's a couple of varieties that I do recommend that have better cold hardiness. Trailing, which is great to grow over a wall or as a ground cover, and the cultivar, upright cultivar called ARP. Uh, both of these have been reliable to negative 10. So hopefully you're not experiencing negative 10 on too regular of a basis. I know I left Michigan so that I didn't have to experience those temperatures. Now, thyme is another great herb to include. There's 32 different varieties of thyme. I set out on a mission this week to buy all the varieties of thyme. I got so confused, I only came home with three. So I have a ways to go before I get all of the collection put together. But just so you know, you may never actually get all the varieties of thyme at once. Now, another great native perennial to include Eutrochium or Joe Pie Weed. I learned this as Eupatorium. And, uh, you know, uh, again, you can see in this picture, it provides nectar for all the pollinators that we love. Monarchs, swallowtails, bees, everybody, all the sexy bugs come to this plant, right? So I grow this with other plants that like full sun, they can tolerate dry, and uh, that includes mustard through the winter season. Some of my favorite varieties are Southern Giant Curled, Ms. America, which I'm growing this year for the first time. And I am so in love with this plant, y'all. It tastes delicious. It, it is grown. It's just been so beautiful. I planted it in October. It's actually in full flower right now. The amount of pollinator activity around Ms. America mustard, there's nothing else in my entire landscape that comes even close to what this mustard is providing. Um, two other varieties that I recommend, Crimson Red and Garnet Giant. And if you're not familiar with Kitsawa Seed Company, you should Google them. They are it is the coolest place that they specialize in Asian edibles. So you're gonna get a lot of different things that you wouldn't normally find in your typical seed suppliers. And uh, it's a beautiful catalog and it's just full of neat things that you've probably never grown. So I highly recommend checking them out. Now this is not actually a perennial. This is an annual sunflower that is a bush type. So it will set like hundreds of flowers at once. And I think it's worth growing as an annual. 
This is Sun Credible Yellow. They actually have multiple colors now in this series of Sun Credible. And I grow it with other summer loving plants like Roselle and Tomatilla. And if you're not familiar with Roselle, um, this is when you drink hibiscus tea, this is what you're drinking. Okay, it's very specifically this species of hibiscus. And what you're actually drinking is um, like the flower bud. And that's what gives it that red coloration. So it's just a great full sun, heat, drought, humidity tolerant type plant. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, we don't always get it to produce flowers because this is actually day length triggered. So they're just starting to flower when we get frost. But I have friends down in Louisiana who grow this and they get like thousands of pounds. So um, it's still worth growing because it's a beautiful plant through the summer. Now, tomatilla that I recommend, um, if you like eating salsa verde, you want to grow tomatillas. I consider these to be the non-diva tomato that we all wish tomatoes were. Um, tomatillas don't need a lot of water. They don't need a lot of attention. They don't need to be staked. Um, they're like the low maintenance tomato relative. And uh, Purple Coban and Rio Grande Verde are really great. Now, I love growing um, Shasta daisies. And this is a cool variety, banana cream, because it has sort of yellow flowers. I recommend growing umble flowers adjacent to this so that you will help feed those pollinators in their caterpillar stage. So um, uh, Shasta daisies are almost always pollinated by swallowtail caterpillars and it or swallowtail butterflies. That allows you to be able to grow these adjacent and then the caterpillars don't have to work very hard to find their food source. And of course, for me, growing carrots I do a better job growing these in containers, and there's a, a handful of food crops that I'd actually recommend in pots. Now, I do a two-hour webinar just on growing in containers, which is why I couldn't include it tonight. Uh, but if you're interested in that, you can drop me an email, and I can send that along to you. Now, I'm a cat lady, so I like growing plants that my cats like to roll around in. And cats meow and cats pajamas are the two kind of new varieties to replace Walker's Low. The reason these are so good is they've been bred for sterility, so they bloom all summer. They don't just bloom at one time. And I grow these with, um, because Nepeta is winter dormant, I grow it with winter active vegetables like kohlrabi and turnips. And if you've never grown kohlrabi, I would like to challenge you to make 2021 be the year you grow them. They are delicious. Uh, my grandparents grew kohlrabi, were Czech in our heritage. And so I've just always eaten kohlrabi as a kid. That was just a perfectly normal thing to have on our plate. Uh, I want to normalize them. They're delicious, they're easy to grow. And I think turnips also deserve more attention. And I've discovered over the years that the way to get kids to eat vegetables is to give them seed. And that was absolutely the case with turnips when we included turnips in our neighborhood entry planting, which the neighborhood kids manage while they wait for the school bus. And y'all, school started today school officially went back to session after over a year of them not being in today. So really April 14th is worth noting more than just for my strawberry harvest. <laughs> but the kids get so excited about eating what they've grown and turnips were no exception. Now, phlox is a really important plant. I recommend mini pearl. This is actually an interspecific hybrid. Um, it's shorter, it blooms earlier than your traditional garden phlox and it's powdery mildew resistant. But for those of you who love the normal summer garden phlox, two varieties that I recommend are Bright Eyes and Glamour Girl. And Bright Eyes is the one with that swallowtail on it. This is a swallowtail magnet. If It's basically like having cable. You can just stand in front of this plant when it's blooming and you can't even focus your eyes because there's so many pollinators. Now again, 
Phlox is dormant through the winter season, so I grow it with things that actively grow in the winter. In the summer, this is growing so big, I don't have room for any vegetables to grow adjacent. The cabbage that I recommend to grow specifically now in the spring is this variety Golden Cross because it's a 45-day cabbage. So many cabbage varieties need like 100 or more days. We're too hot to grow cabbage through the summer. So if you want to grow a 100-day cabbage, you got to start that in October and grow it all winter long. If you want to grow cabbage right now, grow Golden Cross. You will actually get something to harvest. Um, another variety of cabbage that I recommend specifically for container production is Ruby Perfection. Now, this is smaller than what you would normally buy from the grocery store, but it's perfectly scaled to grow in pots, and it does form an edible head. Some radishes that I recommend growing. If you like traditional radishes, Roxanne is great. If you want a radish that brings tears to your eyes, wasabi is the cultivar for you. And I am addicted to daikon radish. So these are also called like the clay buster. And you can see why they're called that. Look at the size of these roots. Now, I just direct seed my daikon radish, and in the Mid-Atlantic, you can direct seed radish 12 months out of the year. Anytime you want to grow it, this plant will grow. Uh, what's really cool, not only does the root break up compact, compacted soil, it's delicious to eat. I actually have a really great recipe for daikon radish au gratin as an alternative to eating the potatoes. And the vegetation helps suppress root knot nematodes, which I struggle with living in a former tobacco field. Salvia nemorosa, most people grow May night. This is the May night improvement, which will bloom for you all summer long because it's been bred for sterility. And again, this is active all summer. I grow it with winter vegetables to compensate for its dormancy. Beets. I, I love beets. I also grew up eating beets all the time. And I haven't, I'm not the best beet grower here in North Carolina, but I, it hasn't stopped me from trying. Um, I stole this picture from Baker Creek because I've never had a harvest that looked this good, but it's something I aspire for. And Brussels sprouts. And honestly, last year I had one of my most successful Brussels sprout seasons. And I think it's because it was cool through April and May and into June. So the trick with Brussels sprouts is they want days that are increasing in day length that also aren't hot, which is generally not the climate of the mid-Atlantic. However, every now and again, we get a year like last year where we can successfully grow Brussels sprouts. Now, a few of my favorite trees and shrubs to also grow along with vegetables. I love using flowering deciduous shrubs to act as living stakes for heirloom tomatoes. So everything on this list works really well when you plant tomatoes adjacent. So I love the native Calicarpa Americana. There are a couple of great varieties worth noting. Welch's Pink, Alba up there on the, the top row. Um, hibiscus uh, is a, another great plant that you can pair with tomatoes and just let the tomato vine kind of ramble through. No one will ever know that you're growing tomatoes because they'll be completely jazzed by all of those awesome flowers. And hydrangea paniculata is a great plant to pair with tomatoes. So if you look on the left side, look at the bottom, you see I've got black prim tomatoes planted at the base of that hydrangea. They grow right up through. If you look on the far right side, you see the foliage coming out where all those hydrangeas are blooming. But the only time you really notice it is when you have a ripe fruit. No tomato cage needed. You can use the structural integrity of these ornamental shrubs to be able to provide everything you need to grow your tomatoes with. Now I do have a few tomato varieties that I wanna recommend. My favorite seed source for tomatoes is Baker Creek. I think they have the best selection of tomatoes for all time. Um, Chef's Choice series, these are actually what they're calling improved heirlooms. So this is heirloom 
that have been bred and selected for disease resistance, specifically blight resistance, which is usually what takes heirloom tomatoes out in the East Coast climate. So Chef's Choice, there's actually, there's six in this, in this uh, series, so you can grow every color. These are delicious slicers that will reliably grow all summer. Um, Dr. White's Yellow, this is a gigantic indeterminate slicer that's frequently over a pound per fruit. So, you know, if you just want to grow something that's enormous that will impress all of your friends and family, Dr. White. Orange Icicle is a really great semi-determinant. This is actually like an orange Roma. So it's great for making um, paste. It's also great for using in salsas. Peche is a uh, tall indeterminate, but very early fruiting. And what's cool about this is that it's got the skin that's much like a peach, except that it's a tomato. So it's just kind of a weird oddity. The French are obsessed with this trait in tomatoes. And there's probably 25 or 30 different cultivars that have peach skin. Now, my all-time favorite variety of tomato is cream sausage, and this is a yellow Roma variety. It's a, it's a semi-determinate. You can grow this in a pot with a normal tomato cage. It's always my first tomato to set fruit, and it's always the last tomato that I'm still harvesting from, usually right up until about Thanksgiving. So I cannot say enough about cream sausage. Honestly, it's the tomato that made me a tomato addict. So it's awesome. Now, Father Gilla, a great native plant that's really well adapted to both dry and wet. I like the variety Blue Shadow, and I frequently pair this with rice. And I know that most people have never grown rice, but it's a really beautiful ornamental grass. Basically, just think of it as a replacement for purple fountain grass, okay? It's gonna grow all summer, and at the end of the season, you have something that you could harvest to eat. More than likely, the birds are going to get to it before you do. So you don't even have the pressure of having to try and thresh your own rice. Don't worry. But it's just a really cool plant to grow. Um, unlike purple fountain grass, which collapses every time it rains, you can grow black madres, which will look just like that, but actually stand upright through all the rain systems that we have through the summer. I also recommend Carolina Gold. Now, Clethera alnifolia, another great native shrub that blooms through the summer season. You can grow this with a variety of plants throughout the year, including lettuce in the winter, peppers, and in the summer, you can pair this with sesame. Now, I was introduced to sesame from uh, Monticello. I figured if Thomas Jefferson grew it, I should as well. And I have been so impressed with sesame. Basically, it's a, an annual foxglove that blooms all summer long. And you know what its number one pollinator is? Hummingbirds. I mean, who doesn't want hummingbirds, right? It's like, that's reason enough to grow sesame. The fact that it blooms all summer and at the end of the season provides you with sesame seed that you could eat or you can just save to plant the next season, is just like a whole other bonus. Now, I think the dried stalks are so beautiful. I use these every year to, to decorate for Thanksgiving. Um, I just think they're, they're super unique. It's a plant that most people have never seen, but everyone's eaten it inevitably on a hamburger bun. Itea, another great native plant that I like to pair with peanuts. And y'all are in Virginia. So unless you are allergic to peanuts, you need to pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. You need to grow peanuts this year, you guys. They're awesome. They're a nitrogen fixer. They're a legume. They're easy to grow. All you do is put the raw nut out of the shell, thumb it into the ground, and let it grow. It loves heat. It loves humidity. It will grow as a ground cover. It will form little yellow flowers. Those get pollinated, they form a peg. Those pegs dive down into the ground and that's actually where the nuts form in the ground. You harvest these typically mid to late October by just yanking them out of the ground, turning them upside down, 
letting them dry out in the sun for a couple of days. And then you can roast them. Um, you can just do whatever you want to do. Like down, you know, in South Carolina, they boil them. Um, so if you've never grown peanuts, make this the year to grow peanuts. Now, where do you buy peanuts at? My best recommendation is if you have like a local farm supply or like a garden center that sells seeds in bulk, you can usually find those there. If not, there are online seed suppliers, including Southern Exposure Seed Exchange right there in Virginia. That is where I originally got my peanuts from. So you have an incredible resource with Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And I highly recommend ordering everything that you can from them because they have really high quality. Now I had to mention magnolias. There's a whole bunch of magnolias. My funny story about growing um, magnolias in my foodscape really started last year as a result of growing seminal pumpkins for the first time. For those of you who have issues with squash borers killing your pumpkins, um, the seminal pumpkin, which is native to central Florida, is borer resistant and also powdery mildew resistant. And I had no expectations for this. Um, I put three seeds in the ground. They grew everywhere. I had pumpkins dangling out of the tops of my deciduous magnolia trees. I mean, it was the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. Getting them out was this huge process. It required like gigantic ladders. Um, I ended up getting 52 pumpkins from those three seeds. And I still have two left. I've eaten, we've eaten them all. Um, and I have tons of seeds. So if anybody wants it, you can send me an email and I will send you some seeds. Um, they came actually in very strange, um, different sizes and colors. And I don't understand this phenomenon whether I, the seed that was given to me by Florida Master Gardeners was mixed up and somehow I ended up with two different varieties, but I got, I got uh, multiple different kinds of fruit from this experience. And lastly, viburnum, and we're in viburnum season. I had to include a picture from the U.S. Botanic Garden where they have mohawk with the capital in the background. It's so fragrant and wonderful. Kanoi, another, whoops, another really great variety um, that, you know, pollinators absolutely adore. Um, a, a deciduous variety, viburnum plicatum popcorn. Um, just a plant that I think everyone should include. Um, viburnum macrocephalum, the uh, Chinese snowball viburnum, which is quite wonderful. And I grow those again with other varieties of squash. These varieties have been very reliable for me, unlike like yellow squash and zucchini, which inevitably get squash borer infestations. Honey boat and white scallop have been reliably insect free. Now, real quick, is any of this animal proof? It is not. I've tried to give you some good information on some perennials that ward off animals, edibles that ward off animals. The reality is we're facing these critters no matter where you live. Um, in your general area, closer to Baltimore, um, Nancy Lawson is um, a wonderful author and speaker. She's written The Humane Gardener, and her information has really changed my approach for dealing with animals. And so I just wanted to share some foodscaping solutions with all of you, because I know that we all battle animals and, you know, we put a lot of effort into our gardens. So it's frustrating when, you know, rabbits come and eat everything overnight. So here's a list of some things that the animals and deer and groundhogs tend to leave alone. And I usually find that these are things that are pretty easy to grow and are pretty easy to use in the kitchen. So it's a, it's a practical list. So spicy edible ground covers, that includes some of the mustards that I told you about, in addition to arugula, which you know starts bitter, it ends bitter, you can let it go to flower and just let it self-sow. Rabbits hate it. Like they get really mad 
when they take a bite of arugula and then they run to your neighbor's yard. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to achieve. We're not getting rid of the animals, we're just redirecting them. Now, potatoes are really useful uh, because they have poisonous foliage. And I think it's also really a great plant to start with kids because most kids eat French fries. So show kids where French fries come from by giving them the experience of growing potatoes. So you can plant potatoes right now. And I recommend planting them right along your bed edge. Um, the reason they're so useful is because they are in the Solanaceae family and their poisonous foliage will deter animals, including your dogs and cats. So basically you just need to make sure that like the small children who visit your gardens aren't going out and munching on your potato foliage. But I promise you, your cats and dogs are smart enough to leave it alone. Now, when they flower, that's the sign that you could harvest new potatoes, but we usually wait and if we've planted in March, we're harvesting in June. So if you're planting now in April, you'll probably be harvesting in July. And uh, we harvest massive amounts of potatoes from our in-ground approach. And in the case with Aiden, this was his first plant that he ever grew. It gave him an opportunity to research recipes and actually cook. So he got the full experience from planting to harvesting to eating and having a real understanding that French fries don't come from Chick-fil-A or McDonald's. They actually come from a farmer who planted them in the ground and cultivated them. And I think that's a really important lesson for all the kids in this world to have, and frankly, all the adults in this world to have as well. Now you can also grow potatoes in containers super easily. I probably have at least 30 videos on my YouTube channel showing you exactly how to do this, so I won't go into the details. My new obsession this year are these Kaveen grow bags where you can actually watch the tubers develop because they've got that plastic insert. And I'm obsessed with trying to figure out how to get these into like elementary schools so that every kid can have the joy of understanding how to grow french fries and understand the science and biology behind the experience of growing this really critical um, food crop. Now, two more plants and then I promise I'm done. Um, garlic and onions for those of you who have vole issues, but also they will help deter above ground animals. So some of my favorite onion varieties you know, you can get onion sets, you know, red, yellow, white. You can get Egyptian walking onions from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And then some garlic information. So garlic is best planted in the fall. Um, you can plant it now, but you're going to be not harvesting it until next year. Um, soft neck varieties are usually what are recommended for the Southeast. Um, there's a lot of really great varieties. Soft neck does not produce a flower, so you don't actually have to worry about, you know, going out and cutting off the flower scape. Um, and they have a longer shelf life. So soft neck is very practical from a home gardening perspective of being able to, you know, keep it longer. Now, hard neck variety, I think, has just a stronger flavor. Um, it's they're, they really thrive in cold climates. However, I have had a lot of success growing hard net garlic in zone seven. I'm on the verge of zone eight where I live, and I've grown all of the varieties listed here with great success. So I don't think you should limit yourself to one or the other. I think you should grow both. Um, some other great varieties for the South or for the, the Mid-Atlantic, basically garlic is kind of like Pennsylvania and North and then everything South of Pennsylvania is considered the South. So here are some other cultivars you could look at and then some great porcelain varieties that do really well in the heat. So all you're doing is thumbing these into the edge of your beds and you're gonna plant them pretty close together, usually like four or five inches apart. That way when they grow, they create an impenetrable barrier that the voles don't like to, they don't like to get through. So the voles don't like the smell of these cloves, which is why they're so practical. 
Now you can eat the foliage and the flower scape specifically on hard neck. Um, you want to remove that flower scape because you need the energy of the plant to go back into developing the bulbs. So when you harvest the bulb, it looks like what you'd buy from the grocery store. The garlic scapes are delicious. Um, I'm just starting to harvest them now. I actually just did a YouTube video on exactly how to cook with garlic scapes. So you can find that on um, Breathe the Plant Lady. The cool thing about garlic is like you don't need to waste valuable raised bed space for garlic. You can just plant this in any sunny landscape border that you have because garlic doesn't need to be irrigated. It doesn't need to be fertilized, grows through the winter, and it doesn't take a lot of room to be able to grow a lot. So in a 12 foot long bed edge, you could produce half a year's supply of garlic. Now you're going to harvest and braid it when the foliage starts to die back and that's usually temperature triggered in the mid-Atlantic that's usually mid to end of June maybe into the beginning of July and you want to cure the bulbs by hanging them in an area with really good airflow so like we use a neighbor's back patio and we just toss these varieties up over the rafters they they sit out there for several weeks and that will enable them to have a longer shelf life when we bring them in to cook with them. Um, if you don't have a covered porch, the main thing is keeping them out of direct sunlight and out of rainfall. So put them in a garage or a shed at a box fan to make sure that there's good airflow so they dry out evenly. Now there's a million different ways that you can preserve garlic. So um, just don't store it in the refrigerator. 42 degrees is the temperature that triggers development that's going to make it start growing again. So that's why you never find garlic at the grocery store in the refrigerated section. It's always, you know, outside in the dry area. That is a temperature trigger. But if you really want to make a difference in the world, and I want this to be the thing that you guys really hold on to, just think about the food miles attached to all the products that we buy. And in the case of garlic, 90% that is distributed through American grocery stores is being shipped from 7,000 miles away. And the bottom line is every sunny landscape in America could be supplying us a source of local organic garlic that simultaneously is preventing animals from eating everything else that you grow. Okay, so there's like so many layers of why garlic should be included in your landscapes. And what I really want you to take from tonight's talk is that every landscape is an opportunity. There's not a landscape anywhere that can't be utilized for something greater than what it's currently offering. And once you start looking around and thinking really critically, You'll never be able to not see it. There's 180 million acres of development in the United States. And I know that we could collectively raise the bar for how we use that developed land. So I wish you guys all the very best this year and in every year to come. I am really looking forward to a post-pandemic existence, hopefully where we've all developed a few better habits and the hobby of home gardening sticks with everyone who's gotten so enthusiastic about it. I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I would love for you to keep in touch if you are interested. I have my books available on my website and I do a monthly newsletter which you can sign up for on my homepage. I am also having an open house. And I know that I'm not exactly in your neighborhood, but I'm like four hours south on I-95 and Raleigh is really beautiful. And you could visit Plant Delights and the Ralston Arboretum and the NC Botanic Garden. And you can come and see me on Saturday, May 8th. I'm gonna have books and plants and seeds all available for people who visit. It's free and there is no registration. So you can just show up and I will be super happy to see you. And I would love for you to keep in touch. Here are all the rest of my social media handles and my email. And like I said, I am happy to send you this uh, entire program because I know that it was a lot of information and I, I hope that I didn't go too far over my time. <laughs>
<laughs> I've gotten really used to doing two hour webinars. And um, I have not looked at the chat at all because I didn't want to get sidetracked, but maybe there are some questions that I can answer. <laughs> 